weekend on C-SPAN 2. Coming up next on C-SPAN 2, a hearing on Saudi Arabian child custody cases, U.S. citizens who claim their children were taken illegally by their Saudi spouses. After that, a meeting of the National Commission investigating the September 11th terrorist attacks. The Senate's back this morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. They'll continue work on a bill setting spending priorities for State Department programs. Now this hearing. This House subcommittee heard from some parents of those allegedly abducted and representatives of the Saudi government and the State Department. I'll come to order. We have other members that will be coming in, uh, but we want to get started because Ms. Hardy uh, has a limited time with us, and we want to make sure that uh, she has a chance to hear uh, some of the other witnesses before she leaves. Uh, I ask uh, a quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Human Rights and Wellness comes to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. Um, and I ask uh, uh, that uh, we allow uh, members who are not members of this subcommittee to participate in the hearing today. Uh, and to ask questions because uh, we have a number of members who are on the full committee that uh, are very interested in this subject and would like to participate. Before I start with my opening remarks, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, yesterday I uh, was trying to get uh, Ms. Hardy here to testify as uh, on the second panel. And uh, uh, there is supposedly, I guess, a, a protocol which says that uh, uh, members of the administration uh, has to go first. And, and I don't have any problem with that. Uh, the problem that I have is that in some cases where you want to set the stage for uh, government uh, uh, executive branch officials to uh, respond to questions, so in some cases I think it's imperative that they hear uh, the problem. Now, Ms. Hardy has agreed to uh, see a, a copy of the tape because she's going to have to leave about a quarter till four and uh, she said she would answer questions that are relevant to uh, uh, issues that come up after she leaves and I appreciate that very much but I just like to say that I was disappointed that uh, Mr. Kelly who's head of the legislative branch down at the State Department uh, was very short with uh, this committee and he indicated that the last time we had uh, a hearing of this type that we uh, uh, beat up on the person from the State Department who was testifying. Uh, I recall that hearing very, very well, and we didn't beat up on him, but we did ask him uh, many, many questions that he could not answer, and we asked him those questions maybe several times. Now, I, I wanted to explain that to Mr. Armitage, and I called him two or three times yesterday, and he's been very helpful in the past, but he wouldn't return my phone calls. So we kind of were stonewalled by the State Department yesterday, which I think is very disappointing. Uh, I do appreciate Ms. Hardy, as I said before, being here, and, and, and she's been very helpful. Uh, the one thing I think is very important for the State Department to realize, and the executive branch, and we've, we've talked about this under the Clinton administration, the Reagan administration, and others, the Congress of the United States has oversight responsibilities over the executive branch. It is our responsibility to make sure that the executive branch and parts of the executive branch don't screw up. And if they do, we have the obligation to bring them down here to the Capitol and, and ask them questions. And sometimes those questions are hard and sometimes the appearance is that we're grilling them. And, uh, and, and maybe we do get a little tough uh, sometimes and for that uh, I'll apologize. But it's our responsibility to do that. And the State Department uh, uh, and the people who work there, for the most part, in fact, for entirely, they're appointed officials. They do not answer to the electorate. We do. And if something goes wrong in this government, we, the elected officials, who are responsible to the constituents of this country have a responsibility to bring the appointed officials down here and ask them questions. They are not a law unto themselves. They work for the people just like we do.
but we are answerable to the people, and for that reason, we have the responsibility to ask these questions. And uh, I wanted to get that clarified today. And I hope, Ms. Hardy, when you go back, you'll tell Mr. Armitage, for whom I have great respect, because he's contacted me in the past and we've worked well together on this issue and others, on issues like this in the past. But tell him I'm disappointed he didn't call me back yesterday, and I presume it's because Mr. Kelly told him what a horse's patootie I was. And so you tell Mr. Kelly also that he is a former Marine, and I don't want to fight with him because he could probably whip me, but tell him that he, like everybody in the executive branch, is answerable to the Congress and our oversight responsibilities, and we need to get along. Okay? Thank you very much. Now I'll go on with my opening statement. Can you give me a glass of water? <clears throat> While I was chairman of the full Committee on Government Reform, I initiated an investigation into the illegal kidnappings of American citizens to Saudi Arabia. There were several facts regarding Saudi Arabian law and culture that make these international child abduction cases noteworthy. First, Saudi law gives Saudi men extraordinary power over their wives and children. A Saudi man literally owns his wife and his children. As a result, the wife or child of a Saudi man may not leave Saudi Arabia without his prior written permission. There have been many cases in which adult female American citizens have been unable to leave Saudi Arabia because they have not been able to obtain the written permission of their male guardian regardless of their constitutionally guaranteed rights as American citizens. Second, Saudi Arabia is not a signatory nation to the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. The Hague, Con the Hague Convention Treaty puts into place general guidelines regarding how to handle international child abduction and international custody disputes. Accordingly, there are no legal standards governing the return of kidnapped children from Saudi Arabia, and there should be. Our investigation from the last Congress led to numerous hearings, several legislative proposals, and even a congressional delegation to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, in August of 2002. Although it's been nearly a year since that visit, I will never forget the tears on the faces of American women who literally risked their lives to come and talk to us. They were scared to death. We had women tell us that uh, they were afraid their husbands would kill them, beat them half to death, uh, or, or worse, uh, if they found out they talked to American congressmen. Women told me they'd put us in a box with our kids and put us in the belly of a plane, anything to get us out of here because of what's going on. And uh, those are the kinds of things that you never forget, especially when you leave them behind and, and you know there's not much you can do about it. Although it's, and I won't forget also how terrified they were that they might feel, uh, fear might face death or, or physical torture if they were anywhere near the U.S. Embassy because the husband's worried about them trying to get away. And these women, live in constant fear, and it's time that the American government does something about it. And uh, Ms. Hardy's going to talk to us about that today. And so will our witnesses uh, uh, who has uh, been able to get out of uh, Saudi Arabia. Because of the attention that issue of international child reduction has received since we started this investigation, we've seen some marked improvements in the way that these situations are dealt with. Before, the custodial American parents were given no hope that their sons and daughters would ever be returned to them. Now we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel, although we have quite a ways to go before we completely emerge from the darkness. And we have some people who had their children kidnapped years ago, like my good friend back there, and uh, they would not fall under new rules and guidelines that have taken place. And we're going to ask questions about them today and how we can do something to allow them to visit the United States and if they choose to stay, stay here. If they choose to go back to Saudi Arabia, to go back there. Ms. Sarah Sega, who's here with us today and who until recently was held in Saudi Arabia against her will since she was five years old, and now she's 24. Just a month ago, she courageously risked her life and fled to the United States consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, with her two children, Abraham and Hanin. Abraham's five years old, and uh, her daughter is uh, Hanin. She's three years old. After a 10-day stay in the U.S. consulate, Ms. Sega was able to secure safe passage for herself back to the United States to be with her mother, Ms. Debbie Dornier. Up until June 24th of this year, they had not seen each other for nearly 20 years. She was kidnapped, 
couldn't see your child for 20 years. Think about that if you have kids. Unfortunately, the reunion was bittersweet for Ms. Sega, who in exchange for her freedom had to leave behind her two children in the custody of their Saudi national father. Ms. Mara Hardy, the Assistant Secretary of Council Affairs for the Department of State, is also here with us today. Both she and the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, have been working hard to bring back American citizens who are being held against their will. I had the uh, privilege of talking to Ms. Hardy when she was about to be appointed to this position with her and, and Colin Powell, and she assured me that she would do everything in her power to uh, help bring uh, American children back and help with this problem. And so far, she's, uh, she's been working in that direction, and we do appreciate that. She's here to update this committee on how the Department of State is handling these international child abduction cases. Also in attendance is Mr. Stuart Verde, the Assistant Secretary of Policy for the Department of Homeland Security. And he's here to observe our proceedings today, and we appreciate that. Uh, and the reason he's here is because we're going to be talking about visas and what kind of pressure we can put on Saudis and their extended families who uh, are, are participants in the kidnapping of American children and what we can do to put pressure on them to bring these children back. We're also kind of surprised but uh, happy to have with us today a representative of the Saudi uh, Embassy, Ms. Manal, Manal uh, Rodwan, is here to talk to us about the Saudi policy on the abductions of American citizens to Saudi Arabia. Up until this point, we couldn't get the Saudi Embassy to uh, respond or participate, so we're glad that she's here today and we'll have, we'll listen with interest to her testimony and have questions for her as well. Ms. Rodwan will hopefully explain why the Saudi government has not been helpful in assisting the U.S. in these cases for years and years and years, and what steps they plan to take to ensure the safe return of American citizens who wish to leave Saudi Arabia. We're also very interested to talk to her about the possibility of Saudi Arabia becoming a signatory nation to the Hague Convention. And uh, we think that would be a step in the right direction to prove that the Saudi government uh, wants to uh, uh, keep their commitment to resolving these cases. The solution is clear. It is imperative for the United States Congress and our Department of State to work together to bring the necessary diplomatic and legal pressure to bear that will guarantee the safe return of these U.S. citizens who are being held against their will. It's also time for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to join the 21st century and finally become a signatory to the Hague Convention. I believe that if we can take these two important steps, we will be on our way, a long way from the conclusion of it, but we'll be on our way to resolving many of these heartbreaking international child abduction cases. As, in, uh, as many uh, uh, in the audience know now, uh, this has been a high-profile issue in the media. Just this past 4th of July weekend, both 60 Minutes and the John Wall Show re-ran segments showcasing the investigation. And I'd like to end my uh, comments by showing a two and a half minute excerpt from our previous uh, hearings, which will set the stage for our hearing today, because I think it says in two and a half minutes what we're up against and what these parents have to deal with. And with that, if you'd roll the tape, we'd appreciate it. It'll be on your monitors. Are we rolling the tape? Okay, good. country would prevent American children from leaving of their own free will? Libya? North Korea? Tomorrow, a congressional hearing begins, and it will hear testimony that Americans are being held against their will, not in an enemy country, but within the borders of an ally, Saudi Arabia. Today on Capitol Hill, there was angry and sometimes emotional criticism of U.S. cooperation with the Saudis. CBS's Thalia Ashuras reports it came from American women whose daughters are trapped in Saudi Arabia. A congressional committee there heard some very emotional testimony from American women whose daughters and granddaughters are being held against their will in Saudi Arabia. These are American children kidnapped by Saudi family members and who lead a life of constant fear and abuse. ABC's 
John Yang reports. I came here today to plead for my daughter and my granddaughter's life. It's like a horror picture. Saudi Arabia is a totalitarian state where my daughters are locked up, wrapped up, and shut up. Heart-wrenching testimony from women desperate to see their children and grandchildren held against their will in a country where women and children cannot leave without the permission of their husband, father, or brother. It would seem unthinkable that dozens of American citizens could be held against their will in a country with which we've long had cordial relations. But that is just what is happening to American girls who've been kidnapped from their American mothers by their Saudi fathers. Most of them never see the United States or their mothers again. Why? Because Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world where a female cannot leave without written permission from her closest male relative. And in most abduction cases, that is her father, the man who kidnapped her in the first place. Case in point, 16-year-old Maha. You just want to see your mother and be with her. And living in the States, I lived in the States for about five years. And um, those were the best years of my life. Well, that gives you uh, the flavor of the hearing today. And before I um, uh, go to our first witness, Ms. Hardy, uh, Ms. Maloney, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, really want to join many of my colleagues in congratulating you on your leadership on this important issue, on holding numerous hearings on legislation that I have joined you on, and particularly going to Saudi Arabia and meeting with these families. Um, I would uh, just like to put my remarks in the record, but I want to really particularly thank Sarah Saga and her mother, Debbie Dorner, who will be testifying today. And it's very difficult to speak on personal tragedies such as those that they've experienced. And I'd like uh, permission to place in the record an account that was in my home, um, paper entitled Saudi Hell, and uh, she is quoted as saying, I can describe my life in one word, hell, end quote, and it goes on with uh, the story uh, that she will tell us about today. I uh, really feel that we need to take stronger measures. We need more than an assurance that they will sign the Hague Treaty, Saudi Arabia Arabia should be a signatory, but also using the tools that we have to deny visas to families that participate in this type of cruel treatment and their families. I would add, uh, Mr. Chairman, the new Millennium account that is moving forward, which is a good initiative. It will um, strengthen our foreign aid policies, and they have a set of criteria and I feel strongly that this could be part of the criteria that we add to the new Millennium Challenge Bill, and that is how are women treated in these foreign countries uh, before they receive the consideration, whether it is aid or visas, uh, from the United States government. We do have the power to make these changes, and, and I feel that uh, you have worked hard in trying to negotiate agreements and they don't seem to be listening. Uh, so I really feel that I would like to join you in stiffer legislative laws denying visas, denying aid, de uh, possibly even sanctions if countries will not release American uh, citizens and that we need to really look at the whole treatment of women within countries before we provide the privileges that we provide through access to our own country through our aid, through our financial and uh, political and, and other uh, programs that we place abroad. But uh, I congratulate you for, for your work on this. I request permission to put my full lengthy statement in the record. Uh, this is wrong. It should be changed. And I look forward to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. And the, uh, without objection, your entire statement will be in the record, Ms. Rossi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have but a few remarks. Uh, I note here that the title of this hearing is focused on Saudi Arabia, but just for the record, Saudi Arabia is not the only place where this kind of behavior exists affecting American families. 
this is hopefully but the most recent of hearings and those other countries should also be uh, subjected if you will to the kind of scrutiny we're going to undertake today thank you miss hardy we're now ready to hear your testimony and and grill you <laughs> we're kidding just to ask you some questions would you please rise so we can be sworn do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do, sir. Good. You have an opening statement? I do, sir. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to be here today to report on an issue that is one of the most important matters before me and that engages me on a very personal level. That is the protection of American children abducted or wrongfully retained abroad by their non-custodial parents, and specifically children abducted to or wrongfully retained in Saudi Arabia. Before anything else, Mr. Chairman, I want to say that the United States Congress has been extremely helpful to the Department in securing the return of abducted and wrongfully retained, retained children. You, Congressman Burton, and many others have backed our efforts to recover children. You have raised cases in your travels abroad where, we have had act, where you have had access to the highest levels of foreign leadership. Your willingness to do so demonstrates convincingly to foreign governments that the United States is totally committed to the return of our most vulnerable citizens. Since taking office last November, I've made two trips to Saudi Arabia, both of them focused on the issue of international parental child abduction and the protection of American citizens. I will return to Saudi Arabia as often as necessary to ensure continued progress. And we have made some progress. Since January, Seven children abducted to or wrongfully retained in Saudi Arabia are back in the United States. Three more are expected to return shortly. An American mother and her five children, all residents of Saudi Arabia, are also expected to return soon. In keeping with Saudi government commitments to us to facilitate parental visits to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, one mother visited her daughter this spring, and others plan to do so in the coming months and also in keeping with Saudi government promises that American women would be allowed to leave the kingdom despite objections made by their male guardians. One American woman was granted an exit permit and departed Saudi Arabia last month. Two other American women have been granted exit permits and are free to leave Saudi Arabia when they choose. A third is scheduled to receive a permit this week and to depart shortly for the United States. Two more American women have assurances that should they wish to leave, such permits will be granted immediately. We will certainly follow up on that should they wish to leave. We meet on a regular basis with Saudi representatives here in Washington and in Riyadh to review cases based on left behind parents' requests and to seek systemic solutions. We have made clear to the government of Saudi Arabia that we will not be satisfied with anything less than the children's return. The Saudi government has expressed its commitment to work with us on this very important issue. We are now working to develop common ground for a bilateral arrangement that could help parents gain regular access to their children, even as they pursue the children's return simultaneously. With the Saudi government, we are exploring preventive measures that will help avoid this tragedy in the future, including information and other outreach efforts. We have posted on our website an information sheet with the implications of entering into a marriage with someone from a country such as Saudi Arabia, where Islamic Sharia law serves as the basis for family law. Ambassador Jordan and our colleagues at Saudi Posts have worked with dedication and determination to assist American parents and their children. I doubt that anyone in this room does not know of the pain of one young American mother in Saudi Arabia who sought and received refuge in our consulate in Jeddah. Ms. Sega's story illustrates the painful realities in these cases and demonstrates how diligently we work to protect Americans abroad. Unfortunately, it also displays the limits of our ability to deliver what is always our goal, the ability of a U.S. citizen parent to return to the United States with his or her children. In Ms. Sega's case, we provided her immediate and unquestioned protection when she needed it and the basic support she and her children needed in a safe place to make the difficult decisions that ultimately were hers to make. We will remain engaged on Ms. Sega's case and in the cases of all American parents who need us in these terribly difficult situations. We have made progress, sir, but we recognize that there is still very much more to be done. I want to assure you today that we will never lose sight of the goal, 
nor of the fact that so long as one child is wrongfully retained or abducted abroad, our job is, in fact, incomplete. As Assistant Secretary of State for Consular Affairs, the protection of American citizens is my top priority, bar none. I give special emphasis to the protection of our children, and particularly those who are the victims of international parental child abduction or wrongful retention. I appreciate the opportunity, Congressman, to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Se Madam Secretary. Um, you said that there were seven children returned. Uh, yes, sir. You have the names of those children? I do, sir. Uh, we, I checked this morning, actually, to be sure and safe. I've got them here, but we don't have Privacy Act waivers for all so of them. So you don't want to read them in the I, I do not want to read them here now, sir, but I'm happy to give them to you uh, okay. right after this hearing, if you like. Um, okay, well, l let me just ask you about some cases sure. that we And we if know. you like, sir, I can actually go through the circumstances of the cases without the names. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, because, I mean, okay. I, I'm sure that the Saudis are trying to put as good a face on this as they possibly can, and uh, they may have uh, uh, done some things that uh, uh, have been beneficial to some people. But I want to ask about some cases that we asked them about when we were over there mm -hmm. uh, that were not resolved. And uh, uh, Pat Roush is in the audience again today. She has uh, children when we went over there. Uh, her children... Uh, uh, were sent to London, they're adults now, with Saudi uh, representatives as well as their Saudi husbands. And uh, after they were talked to by some of the media and some people in the embassy in, in, in London, uh, they uh, uh, put on their abayas and sat in the back of the room and, and uh, asked their husbands what they should do. And so to say that they were free to exp express their feelings when they were in London, uh, is, is erroneous. Uh, I think they were under the control of those people. And it was very disconcerting to me because we went over there in part to see those two ladies and they just seemed to go to London. They hadn't been out of the country for years. They went to London at the same time we went there on a vacation. And uh, that's when they went to the embassy. So those are the kinds of things that have happened with the Saudis in the past. And that's why we have questions about their sincerity. Let me ask you about uh, uh, Samia Saramar. Uh, she had uh, three children, uh, Sophia, Maha, and Faisal. They were abducted by her husband. Maha is the only child that was able to escape with the assistance of hired men last year. And she spoke to this committee in, in uh, I think, our last hearing. What about her other kids, the other kids? Uh, we, as I understand it, sir, uh, the... The parents are not talking to one another right now. We tried when we were uh, last in Saudi Arabia to work to have the uh, taking parent, the father, uh, reach out in some way. Each parent has a child right now. Neither of those child is in a situation. Neither of those children is in a situation that well, is good for them. Well, let, 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 me, let me let me just interrupt here. Uh, Maha was here, mm -hmm. and I talked to her personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no question. She said she was living in hell over there. Yes, sir. She was mistreated, mm -hmm. and she wanted to get out there, and she risked her life to do it, and it was mm -hmm. on 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. and the whole thing was. So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. all documented. Yes. Her brother and sister, she was afraid to ra wake them up because she was afraid all three of them would get yes, caught, sir. and she wouldn't be able to get away. And so she left them behind. But she said both her brother and sister want to get out of there. Yeah. They want to come to America. Uh, they were abducted. And... What I'm asking is, obviously the father's not talking because he right. would not let the mother talk to the children at right. all, and he still won't. Right. But to say that it's a 50-50 it's a issue just isn't the case. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't. Uh, if I implied it was a 50-50 okay, issue, well, it's I mean, not. It's... I, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. the, the young lady wanted to get away. She mm -hmm. is here. Mm -hmm. She's 17 years old or 16 years old right now, and mm -hmm. she's tickled to death to be here. Yes, sir. And uh, the other two want to get here. What about them? Sir, we're going to continue pressing the Saudi government uh, on that case as on all other cases. Why? Well, I'm, we haven't had success on that one yet, although what we try to do in so very many of these cases is seek a way for the parents at least to communicate so that the children can speak to their parents. Uh, communication is never a bad thing. We're not even at that point with this case. Yes, we're very frustrated by it, sir, and not a day goes by that we don't think about these cases. Uh, it is not a good situation. It is not ideal, and we will not stop trying. Uh, 
we're going to hear in the next panel, and I hope you're still here to hear yes, it, sir. that uh, the young lady who uh, was released from the Saudi uh, mm -hmm. government, by, by the Saudi government to come to mm -hmm. the United States, said that her father would kill her if he saw her. And I talked to the ambassador today, who was kind enough to yes. come by, and I have great respect for the ambassador because I think he's done more than any previous ambassador to help he's in this case. Yes. But there's still a lot to be done. And uh, uh, he indicated that uh, uh, she uh, uh, went to a meeting before she left with her father and her husband. Her father and her husband weren't there. I think the ambassador was misinformed. She said she was terrified of her father, that he might kill her. He has a visa to come to the United States. He works for a company that does business in the United States. And she's afraid for her life even here today. And uh, her husband, uh, she didn't want to talk to him, but somebody at the embassy uh, evidently made a call to her and then handed the phone to her husband and she was forced to talk to him. But we'll get into all that later. So I just want to want to say that uh, there's still some big, big problems over there. Let me ask you about Deborah Dosakow. Uh, she was uh, able to establish contact with her children. She learned that both of them wants to return to the United States, but they're not able to do so. Have you talked to anybody with that in that family? I'm sorry, sir. The last name again? Deborah uh, Dosakow, D-O-S. D-O-C-E-K-A-L. I'm sorry, sir. I don't have information on that case. Oh. I'll have to get back to you. Okay, we'll, we'll give you that one. Uh -huh. How about Michael Reeves? His well, children, I, Lily and Sammy, were abducted. Yes, sir. I, I know them. Uh, I have visited them, actually. And? Uh, well, one thing I'd like to say about that case, sir, is we are trying very, very hard. Uh, part of the reason for the visit to see the children was to ensure that they were uh, uh, at least well, healthy, uh, physically uh, being well taken care of. And while we were there, we had a very interesting, I had a very interesting conversation with the taking parent's brother. Uh, his visa has been taken away. We took his visa away as an aider and a better, as somebody who was supporting uh, the ability of the taking parent to have the children uh, outside the United States. And uh, it was uh, the, the first time that I had met somebody who actually felt the pinch of a new tool that Congress gave us. And so it was, a, uh, it was a good moment and an opportunity to explain that that visa would never be forthcoming until those children came home. We made that, uh, uh, I made that statement very clearly to him at that time, to the taking parent as well. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, they understand that now and they have a decision to make, but that's a pressure point that we used, we used well, we hope it will bear fruit. Well, I think that's a step in the right direction. Yes, sir. We're, we're introducing legislation that would mandate that uh, uh, people in the extended family yes. of the kidnapped children would not be able to come to the United States until that was changed, until the children were released. If I might, sir, say yeah. something about that. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, we were going to, in fact, I was going to raise that with you today, that as part of uh, our authorization bill for 2004, we included a proposed amendment to that section of the Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, 212A 10C. And we were hoping to get your support on that Are so that kidding? we would love your support on that. It's a very useful tool. The more that we can do, the more tools we have, the more pressure points that we can find, the better. Actually, in the, in the ante room just before the hearing, uh, we began to have that conversation with Ms. Sega and Ms. Mrs. Dornier, talk a little bit about that. It's a very, very useful thing. It, and but it, it, is, it, is it mandated if there's a kidnapped child that the, uh, the uh, visas be uh, revoked or not a, uh, they can't get a visa? Uh, not mandated per se, sir. It gives us the right and ability to do it. Gives the State Department the discretion? Yeah, but we want to use it. I'm here to tell you we want to use it. Uh, there well, may be a case where... I, b I believe you will, but uh, <laughs> your successors might not. Well, and no, the, the reason I say it that way, sir, is there may be a case from time to time where parents don't want us to, uh, to take a particular step one way or another because uh, they might still be in conversation. That might, in fact, be uh, a step too far in a case where they may reconcile at some point. And so the discretion to use it is, uh, is somewhat useful to us. But uh, there is, there's no way that, uh, that I want to have a tool out there and not use it if it's going to help us get the job done. Okay. I, I have talked long enough here. Let me uh, yield to my colleagues, and I have some more questions for you on these other families. Thank you, sir. I have a whole bunch of those that I want to go through before we okay. get through. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Uh, did, 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 Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson. Okay, I'd like to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to make an opening statement to frame my concerns. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
not for just calling this hearing, but for your consistent dedication to the issue. Last time I checked, the year was 2003, and yet in Saudi Arabia, women are still treated as though they live in the Middle Ages. Here in the American press, we read about the most tragic stories, such as the fire at the girls' school, where girls were trapped inside by religious police as a building burned around them, or the harrowing escapes of Daria Davis and Maha Sayyamar from Saudi captivity. But the greater tragedy is the systematic and profound discrimination and mistreatment women suffer each day and every day in Saudi Arabia. This is a tragedy and a shame for the Saudis, but the shame for the United States is that we continue to foster a close relationship with a country that not only abuses its own citizen, but abuses American citizens as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your commitment to solving this problem. And in the short time I have been here in Congress, I have sat through a number of hearings about the awful way American citizens have been treated in Saudi Arabia and the Saudi's government's complicity in these crimes. I have signed on to and written my own letters to the Saudi and the American governments regarding this issue. So far, I would call none of the responses I have received from either government adequate. The Saudi government in particular likes to tell us that these women are there by choice. But, as I have said before, the reality is that in Saudi Arabia, for women, choice simply does not exist. I hope that in the hearing with the panelists that uh, we hear from in our own government about what steps they plan to take to end the kidnapping and mistreatment of Americans in Saudi Arabia and to improve the lot of women throughout the Saudi society. Our nations, the United States and Saudi Arabia, are bound by shared strategic imperatives. And I don't question the value of that relationship, but what concerns me are the moral imperatives that are pressing on this relationship. I'd like to repeat a message I've sought to send before to the Saudis, apparently in vain. We are not here to lecture to Saudi Arabia, but we are here to send a clear, unmistakable message to the Saudi government. No matter who is in charge in Washington, D.C., the American people cannot tolerate a relationship that goes against the principles on which our nation is founded. If the Saudi government does not solve its problems with providing basic human rights to half of its population, women, our strategic relationship will be in serious danger. So that is the context in which I will be raising issues today. And uh, I'd like the panelists to explain to us what we can do to assist in solving the problem. Now, there is a bill, Mr. Chairman, that you do have. And if it's not complete, I hope you can tell us what we need to do to give you the tools that you need when you're dealing with this government. And I'm sure we will be happy to assist you. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask at this time, Ms. Watson, or do you want to go ahead? Uh, with well, my question was uh, uh, incorporated in my statement, my last statement, okay. and that is, you know, what can we do yes. to assist you? And is the bill that uh, has been sponsored by the chair complete? If not, just let us know during the hearing what we might do in Well, I thank you very much for that. As I've already shamelessly plunged into the request for, for things that might be of assistance to us, the, the language that would expand the Section 212A, 10C of the Immigration Nationality Act would be very, very, very useful to us. We would appreciate your support on that, and I'm actually quite certain that we have it, sir. Uh, I'd like to take a rain check on a second thing that we're looking at now. It's in 1988. 
the International Child Abduction Remedies Act was passed, the ICARA Act, which uh, was served as the implementing legislation for the Hague Convention, the Hague Abduction Convention uh, in the United States. We're coming up on 15 years of the anniversary of ICARA of ICARA, and so what, what I am doing in the early fall is pulling together a group of interested people to discuss ICARA a little bit and see if there are any changes, in fact, to that implementing legislation that might be useful. So we would welcome uh, input, and then, in fact, when we come up with suggestions, if there are ways for change, I'd like to take a rain check on the offer of assistance now until we look thoroughly at that and see if there are new things and new ways that we can build on that. Uh, a third thing that I'd like to ask is needs no encouragement by your presence here today, and that is that uh, it, it's invaluable to us, as I alluded to in my opening statement. It, your participation in these cases is invaluable to us. You're raising them with ambassadors who you meet in this town as well as on your foreign trips. Uh, it gives us an impetus and an extra uh, sense of, uh, uh, of unity as we go overseas and show that it is the legislative and the executive branches that are as serious as we can be about protecting our most vulnerable citizens. It is very helpful as I have traveled to uh, Saudi Arabia twice, Syria, Lebanon, Guatemala, Mexico. Next week we'll go to uh, Austria, Sweden, and Germany, all discussing international parental child abduction issues. When I can use your names, when I can use your energy and your commitment as examples, that it's not just Assistant Secretary Hardy, it's not even merely the State Department. It is the executive branch and it is the legis legislative branch together that has an abiding issue and an abiding interest in these issues. Um, to the degree that uh, uh, the chairman uh, mentioned a little bit ago that we are uh, all uh, appointed, uh, yeah, certainly that, that is true. I am appointed, but I'm a 23 years in the Foreign Service. I'm a public servant as well. And I think that what we do is a privilege and an honor, and we are dedicated to leveraging everybody's energies, every person of goodwill's energy to get this job done. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was not uh, the intention, uh, intention of the chair to denigrate Oh, no, no, I just figured I'd get it out there. What, 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 yeah. we were, what I was trying to explain to Mr. Armitage and Mr. Kelly, not necessarily you because you're here. Thank you, sir. Was to explain that uh, there has to be oversight. Yes, sir. And uh, the elected officials are responsive to our constituents. We, we run every two years or every six years in the Senate. Absolutely. And so... Uh, we're supposed to keep track of what's going on. Yes. We can't many times because there's so much going on. No, but it's helpful but, for us. Your but, interest in these yeah. issues is very helpful to us. Well, do you have any more questions at the moment? If not, okay. Uh, let me just probe a bit and see if the tone of your conversations with the Saudi government at the State Department level indicates that there could be a threat to our relationships if they don't address these cases. I mean, is what do you do? What is the tone when you talk to the government? Uh, I think uh, the tone is always cordial, but the tone is also very, very frank and businesslike. <laughs> Uh, we have issues. We are not going to stop discussing these issues. We have had some uh, uh, success in some of the, in making some progress uh, in that uh, some of the things that you both have mentioned that are anathema and so very different from our own society's way of doing business, uh, they have begun to address, for instance, the right of, uh, of an adult American citizen to leave the country if she wants to leave, regardless of whether her male sponsor or guardian allows it, they have, they have given us that as an assurance that any American adult woman who wants to leave will be given an exit visa even without the guardian's permission. That is in direct uh, response to uh, uh, the, the many people who have made these uh, uh, representations to the Saudis. And that starts with the President of the United States when the Crown Prince visited this country. It goes to all of the legislators who have visited, who have made comments. It's Secretary Powell on numerous occasions. It's Assistant Secretary Bill Burns from the Middle East, uh, our Middle East Bureau. It's me and several trips there. It's, it's working level at our embassies. If it's constant. Uh, I, uh, 
I do, in fact, call it a never-ending conversation, and some people see that as a negative description. I see it as a positive description of how, in fact, we are trying to get this job done. We are, we are simply not going to stop. Uh, in addition to getting uh, uh, exit visas for American citizen women who want to leave the country, we have also been assured that women who might, parents who might want to go back to visit a, a child who is wrongfully retained even if a sponsor will not or does not want them to go back, they are getting those, those permissions and they are going to be allowed to go back in. Some have already, and that will continue. Is it good enough? No, and it's certainly no substitute for getting a child home, and we say that. I say it as I'm saying it to you now, but I think access in the, in the intervening time as we continue to try and get children home is a very important thing for a parent to be able to see their children. And so that is... Uh, that if is you a, yield for a second. Sure, uh, I'm sorry. On that, apparently American women married to Saudis are mm -hmm. able to come to the embassy and they can get a visa, exit visa, yes, pretty automatically. It is what the Saudis have told us now and it has been our experience in the last six cases. Yes. Okay, but um, is it a common practice that the children from that union mm -hmm. are not automatically able to leave with their mothers? You're right, ma'am. That's exactly the way it is, and that, that is where, where our efforts are directed. Uh, well, tell me, how does the Saudi government see the children of that union? The Saudi government sees the children of a union between a Saudi citizen and a U.S. citizen as a Saudi citizen. I see. Even if the children were born in the States while he was in school uh, and yes, then taken back. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And the children are born in the United States, and they're listed as American citizens? The Saudis interpret because the father is a Saudi citizen, just going to school, that these children will be Saudi citizens too? Uh, Ma'am, th in general, that's true. There may be a case that, that I can't think of at the moment where that's not the case, but in general, that's true. A Saudi father uh, is, has Saudi children. Yes. Uh, what kind of legal standing do we have, does a mother have, when living in Saudi, mm -hmm married in the United States to a Saudi citizen, had the children there, mm -hmm. then went home. Back to Saudi Arabia? Back to Saudi Arabia with the husband, mm -hmm. went to his home. Mm -hmm. What legal standing does she have in the Saudi courts, in the American courts, and in the international Well, court? uh, the American courts, uh, there is, there is uh, very little uh, attention paid to American court orders outside of the United States. And in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi courts would prevail. Uh, something that you asked in your opening statement that I should have also spoken to is uh, what else we can do, mm -hmm. what else we can try and do to let people to stop these things from happening. We've got a lot of information uh, on our internet now. Uh, the, our website gets 129 million hits a year. When you apply for a passport to travel outside of the United States, which she would have to do even if she were going to Saudi Arabia, um, right on page two, it gives you the website, it gives you an emergency phone number to call. If you were ever to use this, you would see uh, a consular information sheet on Saudi Arabia that uh, uh, talks about family matters. It says a married woman residing with her Saudi husband should be aware that she must have her husband's permission to depart or have their children depart from Saudi Arabia. It goes on at some length. We have other pieces, a marriage to Saudis, Islamic family law, Saudi Arabia and international parental child abduction, a travel warning on Saudi Arabia, additional information on our Office of Children's Issues. Let me ask you this. Those papers are given to the American female uh, they're available on the website, ma'am. Matter of fact, we've got it on the website. Uh, we've got it in the passport so you know, know where the website is. We, we will find that, you know, no one... But I have a new idea. Uh, how well, do you let me just oh, say this and then you can sure. respond. Uh, no one reads the information on their airline ticket. I know, unless you're and really bored standing at the counter. You don't <laughs> and read no one reads the fine passport. print there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they are reading the information they pull from the website. Mm -hmm. So... Maybe your idea is the same as mine. Would it be uh, practical and effective to, when that person is getting ready to go to Saudi Arabia, that whoever is the consul, you know, whoever's dealing with them, mm -hmm. must read that paragraph to them, be sure they understand, or have them sign off? 
Um, actually, that's a okay. great idea. And so, uh, although we are, we've talked to the Saudis about it. I mentioned in, in my opening remarks that we're talking about how we can share additional information, because of course, uh, a woman, an American citizen woman, going to Saudi Arabia wouldn't necessarily see an American official, uh, except perhaps to get a passport. And in that case, she doesn't have to tell us why she's getting a passport; just that she needs one. So uh, the issue is whether or not we can come to an arrangement with the government of Saudi Arabia so that when they issue visas. Perhaps that is a recommendation we can make, and I'll certainly pursue that. My idea was uh, less creative, but uh, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. And that is, I sell about 7.2 million passports a year. And maybe you won't read page two of the passport, but you'll open the envelope when you when you get something from the passport agency, because you've bought that. You're looking for that passport. So we're going to put a little flyer on top of the passport itself. We can't get you to open a book and read it. Maybe you'll read the little flyer on top to cause your attention to the website, travel.state.gov. We got 129 million hits last year. If I can get people to read that website, uh, that will be a very useful thing. And we will, uh, we will be incorporating that into uh, the mailings that we do for passports so that uh, people have more of an ability to know that there's more information out mm -hmm. there for them. I am a strong believer in informed consent. Yes, ma'am. And uh, some way we have to bring it to the attention of the illiterate. <laughs> you know, people just don't read. Right. And uh, I think that maybe we ought to put a step uh, in between applying and getting your passport. And that is that you need to sign off here that you have read. Mm. And, and that way, at least, they signed it. They've read the above. You know, often we sign and we haven't read the above, but right. it's on them. Right. And uh, I just feel we need to give more information right. in the beginning, in the initial steps, so people can think about the choices they have and what they're getting ready to do. Uh, I, an okay. informed consumer really is all of our best, uh, you know, exactly. it's the best protection for anybody. I agree exactly. with you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Watson. I, I want to make sure before you leave, you get a chance to hear Sarah's uh, yes, sir. comments. Uh, I have some more questions, which I probably submit to you in writing, but uh, there's a couple of other things I'd like to ask you before we get to Sarah. Um, regarding um, Sarah Saga's two children, uh, are they considered American citizens, and if not, why not? Sir, they're not American citizens right now because uh, Mrs. Sega uh, doesn't fulfill the transmission requirements what, for what citizenship. What are those requirements? Uh, that she, uh, an adult who wants to pass on citizenship, needs to have spent uh, five years in the United States, uh, two of those years uh, after the age of uh, uh, 14. Do you think that should be changed? Well, sir, in, uh, we talked about this with, uh, with Congress uh, several years ago. And so in 2002, we passed uh, new legislation, the Child Citizenship Act sorry, of 2000. And what that does is remedy the situation to a degree in that uh, those children, the fact that they are not right now uh, holders of blue passports would have been irrelevant to our uh, reaction had we been able to get exit visas, get on the plane, we will solve this the minute we get home. Because the Child Citizenship Act of 2000 gives us the ability to very, very quickly naturalize them and make them U.S. citizens. Well, it's, uh, we worked hand in glove with the Congress on that. We'd happily look at that again, but it's not an impediment to that coming to America at all. Well, that, that's, that's comforting. Uh, it, it would be nice if we could say that if a child is kidnapped and they have children later, that the, the citizenship rights uh, would apply just as though they were living in the United States. The, the citizenship in these cases accrues uh, through the uh, through the petition process and the fact that their grandparents had transmitted that the parents of the uh, uh, yeah the grandparents uh, can in fact uh, petition for them. Uh, I just have a couple of more things I want to ask you real quickly. Uh, can you put up on the screen uh, the the uh, first uh, letter from Margaret Scobie? Uh, well, I, don't, I don't think she can see that. Did you oh, have a copy I of this? I can't see that, sir. <laughs> okay. Can somebody get her a copy of that so she can see that real quick? Um, In fact, I just, I, we, just we, darn did, that good, sir. Didn't we have an excerpt? That excerpt was blown up. Well, get, give her a copy of that. Here's what that says. It says, we have provided Sarah's passport 
to Saudi uh, Foreign Affairs authorities in Jeddah and ask for an exit perm permit and all exit formalities to be arranged that will facilitate her departure from Saudi Arabia. She also asks to bring her two children, Hanin and Ibrahim, uh, to the U.S. With, to visit their mother, her mother, who's never seen her grandchildren. Uh, and then uh, later on June the 19th, uh, Sarah was in her room or bedroom or whatever you want to call it, and she received notification that there were three members of the Saudi government that were coming to see her, and she had about 10 minutes' notice. And they came in and were with her for about two hours, along with three women from the consulate. Mm -hmm. And uh, she ended up signing a document which says, I declare that I am leaving Saudi Arabia alone without my Saudi national children named in the document. In the event that I would like to see my children, this matter would be left up to their father's discretion, and this would take place in Saudi Arabia. I signed this declaration out of my own free will without any coercion or under any, of any kind of pressure from neither any source nor person. Uh, so she was actually giving her children away because, as you know, the father doesn't have to let the, the, her see the children according to that. And so she knew that she would made a horrible error by signing that. And so the next day, uh, she signed a document that said, when I signed the declaration on June 19th, it was not my intention to relinquish any rights to which I was entitled. I simply intended to reflect my understanding of what I have been told by the government of Saudi Arabia. I did not intend permanently to waive my right at some later time to demand custody of my children, nor did I intend to agree not to seek the assistance of the government of Saudi Arabia in ensuring that I have access to my children. What I can't understand, and maybe you talked to some of these people, and I did talk to the ambassador a little bit about this. I'm not sure he had the whole story because some of the things he told us uh, was in error, and I don't think it was intentional. I just no. think he didn't have the right information. Uh, why would those three women in the consulate standing there, uh, relatively quiet, uh, not tell her what she was giving away? Because this young lady was under extreme pressure. She was scared to death of the Saudi government. She thought her father would kill her if she left that place. She, did, she didn't feel she could leave uh, even if her children didn't go to America. She was caught. Why would they uh, uh, not say this is something you ought to think about for 24 hours before you sign it? Um, to, to start with a visit uh, to the room, uh, Mr. Chairman, I understood that the reason for that was that they thought it would be more comfortable than, than suggesting that she leave the compound to visit them, that the well, Saudis originally had invited her to their offices. I know, but she was, given, no. she was given about 10 minutes. For which uh, I, and, I regret that. And it, the uh, second thing is nobody from our consulate went in and said, now look, they want to talk to you about this. Here's the pros and cons of it. Right. They just all came in, six of them together. Yes, it was the, uh, the regional security officer, the uh, consular officer, and the consul, and the consul general. Uh, sir, perhaps there's a, a miscommunication here because the consul general believes that, uh, that she recommended that the document not be signed. Uh, that, uh, well, that it was I talked to Sarah before the hearing, and mm -hmm. we'll let her speak for herself, but yes. that was not the impression I, I had. I, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable putting, you know, uh, uh, since I wasn't in the room at the time, but the Consul General certainly believes that, uh, that her recommendation was, was the opposite, that it not be signed at that moment. But I have to say that uh, what, we, uh, what we also said at the time was there is no way that any such a document signed in any such situation would ever have been uh, uh, binding. Well, but the point, but the point is, it may not be binding as we view it, right, right. but the Saudi officials that were there right. took that document with them, and they could use that any way they want for publicity purposes right. or anything to make it look like this gal gave up her kids of her own volition, yes, and she we, just wanted to get the heck out of here and go to the United States, and she didn't care about her kids. We know and this. So I, what I can't understand, and I, maybe you'll ask them uh, after you leave mm -hmm. to explain why they didn't take some time, and in the future, if other women come there, it seems to me they ought to sit down with them and say, Here's your right. Here are your rights, mm -hmm. and you ought to think about this and, and weigh the pros and cons before you sign any document. Yes, sir. Because I people agree. like that are under extreme pressure. She thought she'd be killed if she left, and so, uh, 
And then when I talked to the ambassador, he said that she did leave before she caught her plane, mm -hmm. and she met with family members, including her father and her husband. She said that is not the case. No, yes. The father wasn't there right. and the husband wasn't there. And she said if they were there, she wouldn't have gone. Right. And so that needs to be mm -hmm. made clear. Mm -hmm. Also, there was a question about, they said, what kind of a plan do you have? And sh you should go back to your family and stay here until you have some kind of a plan to exercise to, to get out of here. That they indicated, she indicated that that was said to her as well. Are you familiar with that? Um, no, sir, I'm not. Uh, well, I, maybe I should yes. get her up here mm -hmm. so you can hear her whole sure. story, and sure. then you can respond to us uh, uh, later. Uh, let me just ask a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll uh, let you uh, listen to what she has to say. Michael Reeves, we talked about him just a minute, yes, and I'll rush through these. Uh, his wife was not even a Saudi. Yes, sir. But her father was connected to the Saudi government, so he was able to go down there and use the Saudi government as a shield to keep those kids over there. So there ought to be something we can do oh, to get sir, those I, kids back. I regret that we haven't had success yet. I have been very aggressive well, on that that's case. that's one that, that, that really ought to, well, they ought to all be pursued. Yeah, they uh, are, sir. Maureen Daba, uh, she married a Syrian national who abducted their daughter, Nad Nadia, to Syria. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently, uh, she's suspected of being held against her will in Saudi Arabia. Uh, she, re she received custody of her, her children from both U.S. and Syrian courts. So uh, I, I do know a little bit more about that case. I, what I don't know, regrettably, is whether or not I, the Privacy Act waiver has been signed for me to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, well, th this, this, this won't be the end of all these. And right. if you could get us in writing... I'd be we'll, happy to, we'll, sir. I, I don't want to betray somebody's... There's a personal situation in each of I these understand. cases, and I don't want to betray that. I also don't want to not be cooperative with you. If, well, we'll look at it privately, and we'll, we'll discuss that case. Uh -huh. uh, Joanna Stevenson Tonetta. Mm -hmm. uh, Tonetti. Uh, she married a Saudi national, had three children, Rosemary, Sarah, and Abdulaziz. Yes, I met with those children, too. They're gorgeous. They're, they're, they're lovely children. Uh, we are also trying very hard in that when several other senators are uh, involved in that case. They uh, have been for a long time, both parents, in communication, trying to uh, work through. Well, now, don't uh, make it look too good because he came to the United States. He's from Terre Haute, Indiana. Mm -hmm. He was ordered by the court not to take the child out right. of the children out of the no, country. No, I, I don't mean he, to make it look too good. Well, this is important. He was ordered not to take the children out of the country, and their passports were held. Mm -hmm. The court contacted the Saudi embassy here in Washington, said the children are not to be taken out of the country. The Saudi embassy issued new passports to the children. They were kidnapped and taken to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and she hasn't seen them since. Yes. So he's not cooperating. No, no, he no. He kidnapped no. the kids against a court order here in the U.S. I don't think I said they were cooperating. I said they are talking to each other, which is a good thing because they uh, there are some things that he wants that may be able that, that may break a logjam here. Uh, we have some hope in that case. We really genuinely that he'll have give some the kids back to the U.S. Yes, sir. Well, I I want you, I want to follow that case very closely. Margaret McLean. She had one daughter, Heidi, who was abducted in 1997. Uh, recently, she's been able to visit her child in Saudi Arabia, but yes. she had custody. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with that case? I am. In fact, I, I, uh, I met with Mr. al uh, in part as part of the effort to get him to agree to allow her access for a visit. I met with the governor of the Eastern Province as well to make sure that this got done. That visit took place uh, not so very long ago. It's not a replacement for... Access is not a replacement for getting the child home, but we uh, at least uh, were able to get Mrs. McLean the chance to see her daughter, and we are continuing to push and push and push on well, that case. Well, th that's another reason why we ought to use pressure, like withholding visas for the extended families. Yes, sir. Because that was a kidnapping case. It was mm -hmm. violation of U.S. law. If he comes back here, he ought to be arrested and prosecuted. Yes, sir. And so to say that she's been allowed to see her child, I mean, my gosh, that child's thousands of miles away. It's not like you can go over on Sunday yes, afternoon. Yes, it is not a replacement for getting a child so, home, but access is so important. Okay, and finally, Pat Rouse, she's been with us. Uh, she talked to us today, and she said, you know, uh, she watched uh, uh, this young lady come back to the States and her mother visit her, meet her at the airport and hug each other and everything. She said she's been waiting on that for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Her children were taken away from her. Uh, I hope that we don't forget those cases where the children are now adults. Mm -hmm. They ought to have the opportunity to go to a neutral country or to the United States, meet with the mother, and 
without any pressure from anybody else, make a decision on whether they want to stay in Saudi Arabia or stay in the U.S. Ms. Roush has told us in, in witnessing before the committee that all she wants is for her, her daughters to come over with, without any strings attached to them. And if they decide they want to go back after they come over, fine. But if they decide they want to stay in America, they're American citizens and they ought to have the right to stay. And we, I believe personally that they are under coercion and that they were coerced when they were in London when they took them away from Saudi Arabia while I was there with a delegation. And I think it was purposeful to, to make it look like they were trying when they weren't. So that's another case I hope you'll look at, even though that's an older one. Oh, sir, uh, there are a few things I'd like more than to see that happen so that uh, those conversations could be held. Uh, rest assured that I've raised it on both trips. I will never go to Saudi Arabia and not raise it. Okay, well, the, the seven cases that you uh, said uh, yes. where children have been released, okay. I, I'll, I'll talk to you later and you okay. can give us I, copies of those because sure. I am not aware of those. Uh, and they are not the ones that we were asking about when I was in Saudi Arabia. No, and, but three and, of them, I think we, we uh, I may have called you on, sir, perhaps a member of your staff, okay, the first well, three. But there's well, several, with lightning rapidity, several others have occurred. Well, we'll talk about that. And I hope you'll listen to what Sarah has to say because uh, it was indicated that by Prince Saud to me that uh, any woman who wants to leave can leave. Uh, once you hear uh, the whole story of uh, this lady that was at the embassy with Sarah and her uh, and how there was uh, pressure put on them and their families to keep them from leaving anyhow, I think that will give you a different picture because Prince Saud may say that they're trying, but there were government officials that said, you know, cut them off at the airport, don't give them anything, leave mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. high and dry, and, and, and there was pressure being brought to bear to, uh, to uh, uh, force them to change their minds. And, and You're talking about the other family? I'm that, talking about the other family okay. as well as Sarah, and we'll let her testify We about have that. been in touch with them, uh, with her, since, uh, since she went back. Uh, it's it, it so far, uh, we have assured her that we will continue to be in contact with her, and she has been able to be in contact well, with we'll us. We'll let Sarah tell it's, you uh, what, what this lady said to her uh -huh. when they were together in the embassy because I don't think that whole story has come out. Okay. With that, uh, we appreciate you being here Thank and you so much, we sir. will be sending you a tape and with questions from the hearing and with your permission, uh, we'd like to have you respond. Absolutely. Thank okay. you, sir, very much. Thank you, Ms. Harding. And please take our message back to the Secretary and Mr. Kelly. Will you? Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. I'd like Sarah and her mother to come forward now. Uh, where are they? There they are right there, Sarah. Would you and your mother come up to the table? Oh, and Ms. Rodwan uh, from the Saudi Embassy, are you here? Is Ms. Rodwan from the Saudi Embassy here? What? <laughs> Ms. Rodwan from the Saudi Embassy, are you here? Is anybody from the Saudi Embassy here? Well, they said they were going to be here, and they sent us a statement. I guess they don't want to be questioned. Doesn't surprise me much. Ms. Saga and Ms. Dornier, would you please stand to be sworn? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah. Be seated. Ms. Saga, uh, you and I talked earlier, and you had a prepared statement, but you said you'd, you'd rather just answer questions. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like for you to start at the beginning and uh, tell us uh, uh, when you decided to leave and why you decided to leave. Tell us about your father and your husband, the kind of problems you had, physical abuse and all that. And then tell us what happened when you got to the embassy. Just go through your whole story, and you don't have to read that. You can just tell it in your own words. We'll put your uh, official statement in the record. Okay. Okay. Well, firstly, I'm... Well, pull the mic real close. You okay. have a very soft voice. We want to make sure you hear, we hear everything you have to say. Um, first, I want to say thank you to, to you and pull. to all the people who uh, helped pull, pull the mic a little closer because okay. your voice is very soft. We want to make sure you hear everything. Here. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I want to say thank you, and I'm so thankful to be here today. I am so proud that I am an American citizen and that I had the right to come here and say my, my words. Um, what I've been through um, was hard. Um, 
as you know, I was taken by my father from here when I was five years old. And um, I, I was um, cut uh, away from my mom. I wasn't even permitted to hold a picture of her. And uh, no calls on, uh, if they could even pull my memories away, they would have done that. Um, only my, my family members, some of my family members were, who they loved my mom very much would talk about her. But um, as long as I lived with my father, I couldn't communicate with my mom or, or even try to communicate with her. Um, my father married twice and he, he used all kinds of abuse. Um, he beated me, he, um, I was locked in my room for two years and not even being allowed to open the curtains. How many years? Two years. Two years. And uh, my stepmother's also was helping him in that. Um, I was starved. I was held. Um, my, my father um, grabbed my head and, 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 and just um, slammed my head in a wall because I was talking on the phone to someone I wasn't supposed to. Um, <clears throat> my stepmother's family, um, her brothers and sister used to use, uh, um, they, they used to put um, uh, false smelling things in my bed and they, they would pour some medicines upon my, my study books. Um, and, and, uh, and I was supposed to clean up what they did to me. I, I wasn't allowed to even wash my, my, my clothes in the washing machine. I don't know why, maybe. I don't know why. Um, one day, um, I, I took a picture from my grandma, of my mom, and um, my stepmother discovered that I was um, holding the picture, so she wouldn't talk to me, she wouldn't let me, let me go to the kitchen or eat or, or uh, get out of my room. And in the end, I had to kneel down and kiss her feet to just let me <coughs> to just let me eat. Um, so um, I was dreaming of the day which I can come here to my loving family, to my mom, just to live a normal life as any woman or as any human being. Um, my, my, my father was so um, ruthless and cruel to me. He, he used to beat me for just fo foolish things. You know. One day he, I had low marks in school and he beat me with a stick and uh, I went to school with my hands bruised with all colors, blue and purple, and, and I couldn't even close my hands. And I was holding my hands in the disc, and the teacher thought that I was playing with something or writing something down, and she said, take your hands out of the disc, and I, I said, please don't let me do this, I can't. And so m my friend beside me said, told her that she is, she has been beaten by her father. And so I, I took my hands out and she was shocked. She almost screamed when she saw this side. And I, during those years, I've reached a stage or um, I've reached the point that I would want to get rid of my life because of all the suffer I was going through and all the, the bad things I was going through. I had no friend, no one, no family. Also my father was, um, he had some problems with my family, my grandparents and my aunts and my uncles, so he wouldn't go even there. So I had nobody to talk to, to, 
to tell what I was going through. And um, why don't you tell us, Sarah, uh, uh, about how you met your husband and uh, how you got married and then you had children and then how you decided to leave? Okay. Um, when I was 18 years old, my, my husband and another man proposed for my hand, um, just like um, the original way of marriage over there. Um, his sister saw me in, in the school and then she told him about me, so he proposed. Um, I was locked, by that time I was locked in my room and for two years. And in some sense I was so happy to get out of what I was in from that home and um, to try to begin a new life, which I was hoping yeah, to be nice, but um, w um, during the engagement days, uh, I, I couldn't make myself like that man, or I didn't like him. And I tried to talk to my father that, please, I don't want this man. Don't make me marry him. So um, um, he wouldn't listen to me. And I tried with my, all of my family members, but they had no power because the word is for my father to, to say yes or no. Um, I, uh, on, on the night of my wedding, um, I tried my best to talk to my family, to, um, to, to do something to prevent this marriage, but I couldn't. Um, so, um, in the morning, I, I, um, I told him that I don't want him, and he called my father and his father, and they both tried to talk me into completing this thing, and, and they, don't, they didn't want me to get a divorce, and my father said, uh, you're young and you don't know life, you will get used to him, and, and so I couldn't prevent that from happening. After, um, after a year of my marriage, I, I uh, had my son, and um, after another year, I had my daughter. Um, and when I, when I, um, when I had um, my daughter, it was like um, she, she did awaken some things in me that was there, but um, I couldn't feel it because at that time I, I was a mother and, um, and uh, for my luck, um, that was the time that the internet entered Saudi Arabia. And so I, I, I tried to um, talk to my uncle, what can I do to search for my mom? And um, so I went, to, I went to Yahoo website and I, I wrote down my mom's name and um, then um, I couldn't get her number, but um, then I wrote my family, my mom's family's name, and um, I got um, my grandma's number. And I knew that she lived in um, uh, her own house. She's not moving. And so I called her, and um, the answer machine answered. And uh, so I left a message saying that, my name is Sarah, I'm looking for my mom, and um, um, I hope that I can still call your grandma. And so um, I called the next day, and, and she was my grandma. And I was so happy. We were all happy and crying, and, and then we exchanged numbers and emails, and we, we talked to we kept talking to each other for three years. Um, at that time, um, I, I was trying 
since I, I talked to my mom, I, I was trying to get my husband into taking me to any, anywhere so I can see my mom. First, I, I pleaded with him to take me to America so I can see mom. But after a short while, um, um, he, he, was, he was saying no all the time. He, he, he wouldn't take me anywhere. So, and he was referring that to money problems. He doesn't have enough money to take me. And, and, and so, <clears throat> um, one time my mom offered uh, that she will uh, pay everything for us to go to France so we can see each other. But he also refused. And I think that my father had some influence on him. He was talking to him. And because he was, he was acting like, uh, he, he, as if he was thinking the same way my father does. Um, and so, um, and during those three years, I tried every way possible for, him, for me to convince him to take me to my mom. And one day we were arguing about that and he said, why do you want to see your mom? I don't understand this relationship between you. And I said, I haven't seen her in 18 years and you're asking me why I want to see my mom? And so I knew that from the beginning he wasn't, um, he wasn't going to help. So then I decided that I have to do something because he was also beginning to be very verbally abusive with me and physically abusive with the children. And, um, and I, um, I know that the only way I can be safe and free is to come with my children here to America. So I began planning with my mom for a safe way to get out of um, Saudi Arabia. It was very dangerous and I was, I was so afraid and I, I had to be secretive, nobody knows. And, and, and I was losing, losing my, my way and my hair and I was suffering skin problems and, 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 and I tried to be as normal as I can. And um, and then when the and the, when the chance came for me to go to my grandparents' home, I went there, and I pleaded with him to leave me um, for one night because my grandpa was sick, and so um, I I, uh, I stayed there, and at five o'clock in the morning, I woke up, waked up the children, and. Um, and we went to, I took a taxi and we went to the consulate. When, um, when we arrived there, um, I, uh, I went through the checking and, and everything and then um, I stayed in the lobby for a, a long time, probably two or three hours, until somebody came to talk to me and they were asking me, what's your case, what do you want? And then we went to the, and then um, Lauren came and she um, also asked me, why are you here? And then we went to the Council General's office and they tried talking me into going back to my family. Uh, what did they say to you? I, I, I think this is very important because we want the State Department and, and everybody to understand what a woman goes through when, uh, when, when that happens. They, um, at the beginning, they told me that um, if it's um, if you can go to your family, go now, and uh, and we will help you. We will um, um, stay in touch with you. And I told them that I can't go back because if my father ever knew that what I've done, he would kill me mercilessly. And so, um, um, and they told me that we haven't known anything about you before, so we don't have a file about you. If you had called us before, we could have helped. And um, of course, it was too late for me to go back. 
I couldn't go back. But I was in, in so much fear and pain and I called my mom and I said, what, sh what can I do? I, I, I was afraid and I was, uh, I was so desperate to get out of that country. So um, I, uh, I refused to go and, and, they, and they called the woman who was in the consulate over there to, as if to convince me to, um, to you know, look, this is a woman who've been here two weeks and she, she couldn't do anything, so you better go back because we, don't, we can't do anything for you and your children. Uh, there was another woman there that had been there two weeks and she, they said they couldn't do anything for you and your children yeah, and for you yeah. to go back. Yeah, th she, they were, um, she, she told me, the other woman, that um, um, the, the people at the consulate um, tried to find someone who was helping the woman and they couldn't. Um, and so um, that woman was convinced that nobody was helping her and she was helpless in the consulate. She has to, and in the end she was so afraid she had to go back to her husband and uh, with her children. And um, um, although um, their children, I mean her children were um, with American passports, she was trying to tell me that, look, my children have passports and they couldn't go, so my children are, they don't have passports, so she was trying to tell me. Okay, so, so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this woman had passports for her, for her children? Yeah. And did she have passports for herself too? Yeah. So she had passports to leave the country and she's an American citizen and the council wouldn't do anything? No, no. And so she went back? She went back. You, do you know what happened to her when she went back? Um, I don't know uh, what happened after she went there, but uh, the reason she, she went back is because her husband has a, he had a, a paper saying that um, from, from a very high position man, that um, there, if, if she didn't um, hand him back the children, he will throw her in jail and she would never see the children again. And so she had to go back because yeah. of that threat. Yeah. Okay, well, go on and tell us what happened to you then. And so um, I stayed um, at the consulate, and I had to, at the first uh, day I, I went there, uh, because we were sharing the room with this woman. She had three children, and I have two children. Um, um, and the room was... Um, Th there was two single beds in the room, so um, they told me that I have to have um, some money because I have to be by um, what do you call them? Sleepy, sleeping bags, sorry, and um, I have to buy food for myself and my kids. And of course, I, I didn't have money because I ran away. I didn't have any anything with me, and so I called my mom, and she transferred some money f for me there. Um, I, <clears throat> Why don't you pick up when they started talking to you about what you should do and when you said you wanted to leave the country and just tell us what happened when the people came to visit you and everything. <laughs> just go into the details of that. Um, from the beginning they were convincing me that um, it's okay for you to go, but your children can never go unless um, their father gives the permission for them to travel with me. Um, I, I actually went there with the belief that um, somebody would help me, I mean, hear from the government, to take my children with me safely to America. And when I saw that the consulate people were, were not helping, they were, they were just... Keep, they kept telling me that um, they can't do anything for the children. They can help me go out, um, but they can't um, help the children. I mean, help me take the children. 
and um, Margaret um, Scooby went to the to Prince Saud al Faisal, and um, he said also that um, I can go, but the children cannot go unless their father give the permission. So. Um, um, we were having meetings every day from seven o'clock. I would wake up and um, and uh, I would go with, to the meetings with my children. And um, every day they would ke keep saying that, "What do you want to do? What's your plan?" And um, they would keep telling me of, again and again that I can't take the children. And so one day, they wanted me to go to the Saudi ministry, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and in the last minute, I had um, communication with someone in the family who told me that um, the ministry, the Saudi ministry, was planning to let my husband come to their office over there in a weekend day where there was nobody but the people who were going, uh, going to talk to me. And in the last minute, I, I refused to go because I was so afraid that my husband would, if I was out of the consulate, he, he could do anything. He could take the children. He could let the religious police catch me or take me to jail. So I didn't go. And so the next morning, or the, sa the same day, um, um, uh, the consulate general called me before um, um, those Saudi officials came, 10 minutes before they came. And um, for my... So, so you had no notification that Saudis no. were coming in to visit you until just 10 minutes before? No, I, I had no idea that they were coming to the consulate and into my room. Um, so, uh, for my surprise, they knocked on the door and I saw three men with uh, three women so from the consulate knocking at my, do my door and they walked inside and they started, um, I mean, w uh, the Saudi officials started talking me into the same thing. Um, we've talked to your husband and um, 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 you can't take the children with you and um, um, I'm sorry, um, I forget to say that uh, um, that day before the men came, um, I had a phone call and the, uh, the, um, the operator there said that um, the consulate general wants to talk to you. And so I said, okay. And when I, 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 I got the line, it was my husband talking from the consulate general's cell phone. And so I was, I was trying to avoid talking to him. You didn't want to talk to your husband, but the council no, general. No, I didn't want to talk to anybody. Called you and, and, and handed the phone to him. Yes. Okay. And so um, I was forced to talk to him, and um, he told me that we we can go to some kind of agreement about the children, but um, and he told me later that the Saudi officials told him that um, if 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 your wife ever took your children out of Saudi Arabia, you will never see them again. And so they were, they were making sure that he knows that um, there's a possibility of, um, of him not seeing the children, which I wasn't uh, going to do that. I was going to find something, a visitation, um, uh, or something between us to, to see the children. Um, other thing is that uh, he told me that um, the Saudi officials told him, one of the Saudi men over the ministry told him that uh, take your, um, um, just uh, talk sweetly to your wife, give her whatever she wants, take the children, and then just leave her to deal with her, her own problems at the airport. And so, um, I was so I was so angry to know that 
you know, they would go to such extreme to, to, I lost the word, sorry. Um, to uh, not let me take the children with me. So um, when, they, when the Saudi men came, they started talking about, um, um, you know, that we can't let the children go. And um, there was no chance for them to go unless their father said yes. And, um, and so when I, um, and they showed me a paper which, um, um, which I, I thought that the consulate people, um, I mean the consulate uh, of officials, who, uh, who, um, they were the one who wrote the paper. The, the document they put in front of you, you thought was written by the consulate people? Yes. Did, did, did they say anything to you about the paper? Um, 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 this is the paper, this is the paper where, Ms. Saga, this is the paper where uh, you agreed to give up your children and not to see them unless the father said it was all right. Yes, the paper, the paper um, said that um, I am given, by signing that paper, I'm giving up the custody of my children in Saudi Arabia. And I was, I was, um, I, when I signed the paper, I, um, I immediately knew that I, I shouldn't do that. And did, did you get any advice from the council, council of people? Did they say anything at all to you? Um, like you ought to think about this or? No, they said, this is your decision and we can't force you into doing anything and that's it. But you didn't have much time to think about it. No. And um, um, so I was so afraid and, um, and I called my mother and t told her what happened. And, um, and then the second day, I mean, the, the next day, um, they, they wrote another document which says that by signing that paper, I'm not giving up the custody of my children or, um, and so um, the whole issue was about the custody. There was no help for me to take the children out. They, they didn't even ask about my children. They said in the paper that um, I was asking for the children, yes, but they weren't asking for their exit. Um, after that, I, I, my husband started calling me at the consulate and um, he said, look, I, um, I am not going to, um, I, I will do anything to um, let you contact the children. I'm not going to let you, um, I'm not going to repeat what your father da di did to you. And, and so um, I, I, I told him that I can't trust his word. So I, I, I asked him to write a paper in front of the um, Saudi ministry and the American consulate that he would never um, do such a thing. I mean, cut my children off me and, and, and he would help to let me visit them, see them anywhere um, outside of the uh, uh, United States and Saudi Arabia. Um, so um, he said, okay, and he signed the papers, but I've been here for two weeks and I can't talk to my children. The only thing he, he is doing is he's letting me listen to their voices on the phone, but I can't talk to them because he can't handle their crying. And um, I, I tried to call his sister because he's leaving the kids with his sister. I tried to call her and, and I asked her to let me talk to the children, but she said, I'm not going to let you um, talk to them. And um, because I, I have enough children and I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to let you talk to them until they are with their father if he, when he marries again. And so um, that paper in my think was, 
um, useless because he is already um, cutting my children from me. Oh. Let, let me... Uh... Miss, uh, Miss Hardy, when she testified, said earlier that one of the women from the consulate, when they were in there with the three Saudi men, uh, advised you not to sign that paper. Did no. any of them say don't sign the paper? No. All they, they said was what? That this is your choice. If you want to sign, sign. If you don't want, this is up to you. But they didn't, uh, didn't advise you to wait or look at it or think about it or? or no. Nothing. Hmm. And they no. didn't say don't sign it? No. Did they advise you to sign the paper the next day? Did they come up with the paper the next day? They gave me the paper and said, look, this is, um, this is something that we can correct the, the, the other paper with. Did they, did, they, did they bring that paper in without you asking for it? No. Yeah. So. In other words, they just, they just brought it in and said, uh, when, this, when, this, when, will, this will correct what happened yesterday. Yeah, because I talked to the Consulate General and I said, look, I, I, I don't want the paper to be, you know, if you can just tear the paper or do anything, I'm, I made a mistake by signing that paper. So please, I want to, I don't want that paper to be, that, that's not the thing I want. And so they brought the paper in yeah. later after that? Yes. Okay. Now, I know this is uh, just uh, <clears throat> your opinion, or maybe you could just tell us, what do you think the South or the uh, U.S. Consulate Office and our counselors over there could have done to help you that they didn't do? Well, what I think is at least they could have um, asked for my children f with the Saudis because they were talking with the Saudis all the time, and they didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't feel like they were... Um, cooperating in, 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 in my children's case. They wouldn't help you get your children. They, they said they would help you get out, but they Yes, didn't. for me it was okay to get out, and, but for my children, it was hard for, for them to do that. And so they were leaving um, the thing up to my husband. Okay, Ms. Watson, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? When the paper was in front of you, did they explain to you at all what was on that paper and what you would be committing to? They only um, gave me the paper to read. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, uh, you read the paper. And, um, and they were telling me that that's what they came um, I mean, that's what they thought that um, it is the something which is going to help in my case. Did at um, any time they talk about you as an American citizen and what your rights as an American citizen are? Um, they told me that um, I can have an American passport, but. I was told also that I have to have um, an exit permission from the Saudi ministry, even if I'm an American. So either um, both ways, um, I mean, if I went out on my Saudi nationality or my American nationality, I would have to have the permission of the Saudi government. That's what they told me. Were they talking about a visa when they talked about an Exit from um, I don't um, I don't remember the name, but it was something like a visa, a permission for me to get out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, what I'm getting to, I want to know, did the consular from the American embassy explain to you your rights and explain to you your rights in connection with the children whose father was Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm trying to get to that kind of conversation. Um, do you mean my rights in uh -huh. going out of Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. 
Well, and your children's. And my children. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, um, they were they kept telling me that um, um, I can go out uh -huh. as American alone, but if I want to take my children, um, they they have um, because they have no um, American passports, so they would have to have their father's permission going out of the country. And um, 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 uh, and I was, I was told also that, um, that even if I'm an American citizen, I have to have the government's permission to get out. When you initially took your children and went to the consulate or the embassy, uh, were you aware of what was required of you? Did you have any idea what was required of you and the children to leave Saudi Arabia? Actually, um, I knew it wasn't going to be easy uh -huh. because there is, um, the people there are stubborn. They won't let me easily go out. But I hoped by talking to the American people here and to the media and by the help of the government, I would, um, I, I, I would take my children with me. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm really getting to in asking these questions is uh, the procedure inside of the embassy. I was a former ambassador too, and I know what happened in my embassy. And uh, I think it's incumbent on the uh, embassy staff, the consulars that deal with passports and visas to walk you through your legal steps. And uh, I don't know if I've heard you say that they walked you through it, so you had an understanding. I heard you say before you came, you knew it wouldn't be easy, it would be difficult, because the people were so stubborn. But I think the consular should have explained to you legally so that you would understand what you were up against and walk you through it. Uh, so I can't quite make out if you knew exactly once you got there uh, what your legal rights were and were not and how they could help and could not help. And nobody at all talked to me about my legal rights. Mm -hmm. And all what they did, that they gave me the application for the passport and I filled that application. Um, that's all. I, 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 no one never spoke to me about my legal rights and what I should do and what I should do because I wasn't familiar with American law. I lived there all my life. Mm -hmm. and um, I think your case is probably not unusual in countries like that. And that's the reason why I made my statement, Mr. Chairman, because I was trying to put it in that framework. It's difficult for women in many of these countries, not only in the Middle East, but Southeast Asia, down the Pacific. And I think there is something that we need to do in terms of our State Department process. Wherever we have an embassy and someone looks for refuge there, and particularly in your case and other American women like you, there should be a procedure, and I want you to respond, that will let you know exactly what your rights are, rather than encouraging her to go back into a situation that would put you at high risk. And we know the risk. And uh, I thank the chairperson for holding these hearings because we have heard from people just like yourselves the actual facts to their captivity. I like to call it captivity. But anyway, uh, we might be able to, through legislation, develop a procedure so you will know exactly what you're going into when you leave to go. And if you go into a consulate, if you go into an embassy, what to expect, and they should walk you through so you will know your legal rights and your children's rights and the rights of the person whose country you're in. Yes. That would be helpful to you. So when you call your mother, you can say, look, I can't get the kids out, but I can get out. Maybe we can fight uh, in the courts, the international courts, to get our children. But uh, would that be helpful? Is that, some, is that a step that we need to take? 
Yeah, actually, it would be helpful, but the case in Saudi Arabia is the power of men over there. They Exactly. Even if, if the woman knew that when she goes to the, a consulate or an embassy, she should do this and this and this, but uh, and she couldn't do this and this, but um, the problem is if there is anything, um, I mean, um, to help the women over there, because I think this is um, the country where um, a lot of women are unable to came forward and say that I want to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if there is anything which can help those women, I mean, um, to make the, the power of those men less um, on those um, poor women, um, I would say that would be a great thing to do. Thank you. Uh, it's broader and bigger than just your case. It's the case of all womankind yes. in these uh, developing or underdeveloped countries mm -hmm. and their treatment of women. It's a struggle for women's rights. Yes. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you so much for your responses. Thank you. let, let me just uh, add, add a, thank you Ms. Watson, let me just ask a, a couple more questions then I'll yield to Mr. Osi in case he has any questions since he's returned. Uh, do you still fear your father? Uh, as I understand, he has a visa to come to the United States and works for it. Was it a U.S. company? Uh, he, he lived here and he studied here. He married my mother. So um, he, have a, he has a green card. So he can come freely here. Does his company, he has a company that has business in here in the United States? Yes, he works for uh, Aramco. Aramco? Aramco. Aramco. Mm -hmm. Does he travel back and forth to the U.S.? Um, I don't know, really. He has traveled um, several times, but I, um, he doesn't tell where he's here. But you going. still have concerns about your safety? Yes. You, yes. Think, you think that he would hurt you if he had a chance? Yes. Uh, now, I know you can't speak from experience or from personal knowledge, but do you think there's a lot of women, the American women over in Saudi Arabia that would like to leave there uh, that, uh, that are suffering from the same kind of problems you did? Yes, yes. Um, from did you know of any others that, uh, that, that you think would, would like to leave if they could? Well... You don't have to give their names or anything. No, um, actually, personally, I didn't um, uh, know someone who wants to get out, but I know some women, American women over there, which have, they had uh, problems, divorce problems, and problems with the children. And I've heard stories about them. And um, uh, from, from the, I think almost most of the families there have the same story. A man goes to the USA and he marries a woman and have children and then the problem begins. He, he in effect owns them. Yes. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? Maybe uh, let me yield to my colleague, Mr. Rossi, first to see if he has any questions. Then we'll ask your mother if she wants to make any comments. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to get my own time, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Okay. I just want to clarify something. I, I apologize for having to leave. I got scheduled into the chair over on the floor uh, from three to four. I just want to clarify something. I understand that the representative from the Saudi embassy did not show, Mr. Chairman. The representative from the Saudi embassy did not show? No, uh, they sent a statement over from the Saudi embassy, and she was supposed to testify, but she didn't show up. Okay. And I also understand that there was a discussion here about uh, Ms. Saga's citizenship in the sense that she had not spent the requisite uh, five years continuously in the States in order for transmission to take place. Is that accurate? As far as the children are concerned, right. All right. So here's, if I understand the following on to that particular thing, I just want to, Ms. Saga, this isn't Ms. Dernier, this isn't directed at you, I just want clarification. If I understand then the fact that our government and our State Department cannot, if you will, uh, for lack of a better term, liberate these children, they are in effect being asked to relinquish that which billions of people seek 
but their own government can't protect, which is their citizenship. They are held hostage in a foreign country to a date certain beyond which they cannot comply with the laws of this country to effectuate transmission. Do I understand that correctly? That, that is correct. The, the uh, lady that uh, testified earlier, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hardy, Ms. Hardy yeah. she uh, indicated that uh, uh, there is a provision in law that allows them to, if they come to the United States, to, uh, to uh, stay while uh, seeking citizenship. But as far as being citizens with the rights of the United States, uh, they, they aren't. I apologize for I may have missed this discussion. Was there any discussion from Ms. Hardy about accommodating or addressing the circumstances under which a child, a minor, whose actions and activities are, frankly, are legally constrained in the first place, but where the presence of a minor in a foreign country physically prevented from coming here loses their citizenship? There's no provision in law for uh, well, addressing it, that? It, it, according to the law, as, as it's been presented to me, and as she uh, mentioned in her, com in her comments, uh, if the parent, the mother, has been out of the country for more than five years and she was a minor when she went over there, her children, the issue of that marriage, is not considered an American citizen, but they will allow them to come to the United States under a visa, and then they can go ahead and uh, and uh, and uh, make application for citizenship. So, if I understand, if I understand, I had I had a constituent. She moved to San Francisco, as I recall. She had two daughters who were abducted and remain in Saudi Arabia. They have now become of majority age under our laws. They have lost their citizenship. No, uh, no. Uh, she was an American citizen when she had the children. Correct. Yeah. No, she so the, cho the children have not were not here for five, for the requisite number no, of years. No, they're talking about the parent. the parent. If the parent was out of the country for five years and they had children, those children did not gain American citizenship as a birthright like you would if you were born here. So what if the what if the parent comes back but the children do not? Well, that's the problem we have right here. That's my point. Yeah, I have. I have a former. Constituent. Her children. Her children, in effect, have no rights as an American. As American citizen, citizens, even though they were born of an American. Citizen. I dare say the Saudis know this. They do know this. I, I. I have to say, Mr. Chairman, I'm somewhat pleased to see the administration start moving our military to Qatar and Kuwait or Bahrain. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to understand that we are at least taking what appear to be some steps to no longer defend that which is indefensible. Now, I, I don't have any questions for Ms. Sayer. I mean, I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am to have you home. I mean, you've, as I understand, you're in Fresno, which is, if you will, down valley from where I am, and I'm pleased you're here. I'm sorry your children are still there. Thank you. I, I just, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. O.C. We, uh, I think we've covered just about everything. Ms. Dornier, do you have any comments you'd like to make since you're here with your daughter for the first I time have, in a long time? I apologize. I, I thought that I was going to have a chance to make a statement, and so I did prepare something. Sure. Well, Is you're that welcome. possible that I could sure, deliver Sure, you're welcome statement? to do that right now. Sure. Thank you very much. In 1975, I met a man who called himself Steve and appeared to be an American. We dated, and later I found out that I was, once I was already involved with him, that he actually was a Saudi named Wahid Saga, and many asked why I married him. To me, he was different from the other Arabs. He was very Americanized. We married, and over the years, he changed, especially after Sarah, our child, was born in 79. He became more abusive and unreasonable. And in our divorce negotiations, he wanted to take her, then age three, to be raised by his mom. I got him to compromise by agreeing to allow her to visit his family in the summers, knowing that his family had been very supportive of me in the past. Initially, he did this, but the, then in 1985, he took her and refused to return her. I offered to go be his mother's maid so I could just be with her. This plan seemed to be progressing, but he said I would have to give up my American citizenship, marry him, and become a Saudi. After the advice of my family and much prayer, I decided that I could have more success from here than from there. 
Once informed of this decision to stay here, he cut me off from all contact with Sarah and ensue, what ensued were years of silence. I tried to, tried to get a bench warrant and take legal action against him, but all avenues required my notification of him of my efforts. This I could not do because in our first conversations after the kidnapping, he promised me he would kill Sarah if I tried to get her back, saying she was better dead than ever returning to this evil country. Even to this day, members of his own family believe he would do this without a second thought. The State Department at the time promised they would have record and passport available to her if she could ever get to the embassy, but that they could not risk relations with Saudi Arabia for one child. To say I was upset would be a gross understatement. My hands were tied at every turn. I decided not to risk her life by going to the media and prayed that in time things would change. Then in 2000, just one month after, we celebrated Sarah's 21st birthday telling the younger family members stories about her and celebrating who she was. She called. The tremendous joy was so incredible, she was alive. We renewed our relationship, and the tales of abuse and torture, she told me, broke my heart. But at least we were in contact again. Then one day, after many attempts to try to get her husband to let us meet, she said, Mom, I can't live this way anymore. I have to take my children and get them out of here. And so began our quest to help Sarah come home with our babies. We heard of Pat Roush via internet searches on Saudi abductions, and she, along with others, helped tremendously in the coming months to facilitate Sarah's escape. Ultimately, Sarah was able to get her husband to take her to see her grandparents near the consulate in Jeddah. And that evening there in California, I waited what seemed endless hours to hear if she had safely made it into the refuge of the consulate. Never did I expect that that first call would reveal that the people there at the consulate would already have tried to convince Sarah to go back home. In the days to come, I had to explain to officials that in fact her life was in danger if she left the consulate compound. She was constantly telling me that she had meeting after meeting. Each time they gave no hope to help her get her kids. The counselor officials were unwilling to represent Sarah's best interests over that of the Saudis. First, they told me they were, were not equipped to have Sarah there because someone else had sought refuge there and was using the apartment. When convinced that Sarah was unable to leave, then I was told, they told me that I'd need to send money for Sarah and the kids to eat because the consulate had no funds to pay for their food. Even Matthew Gillen from on Overseas Citizen Services didn't tell me he was supposed to be my state, side, state Department contact until the Fox News correspondent found out for me days after our first conversations. We had spoken a few times to facilitate getting money to Sarah and briefly get background details on her case, but that was all. It seemed that no one wanted to help Sarah come with her kids from there. On one occasion, I asked Mr. Gillen to have officials stop pressuring Sarah to sign documents, of which she could not know the legal ramification or even understand without legal advice. He said he could not do this. She was an adult and could make her own decisions. When I pressured, pressed the issue, I explained that by leaving at six, she had no concept of her rights under American law. And I suggested that, uh, he suggested that I was making a big deal out of the issue but that there were lots of lawyers the consulate might be willing to work with, and he could fax me a list. When I received the list, they were all Saudi men in Saudi Arabia who could not be necessarily assured that they would represent Sarah and her children's best interest over that of the Saudis. By the time I had procured an American lawyer, they had not only refused to fax us a copy of the documents they were having her sign, but had already worn her down to the point of exhaustion mentally and physically, such that she agreed to take the best deal she could get to keep contact with her kids and come home to continue the fight for their freedom. To date, every promise made to her at that time to keep contact with her children has already been broken. She has only been allowed to hear her children's voices in the background of phone calls and not to speak to them. The loss is unbearable for her, but we stand together to fight for as long as it takes for her children to come home. As always, we remain concerned that her father, Wahid Saga, holds a green card to the U.S. and works for an American company, Aramco, there in Yambu, Saudi Arabia. We have no doubt that if he could, he would silence us both for good. To date, we have not been successful in preventing his entry into the United States as a deterrent to further violence against my daughter or myself. 
Ms. Hardy says that now Saudis are saying that adults will be allowed to return. But let me point out that by that time, they will most likely be mothers themselves and required to leave their own children behind, perpetuating to a new generation this atrocity. In closing, let me just say that if a woman must go through what Sarah did at the hands of her own government consular officials, I am sure few will flee for home. As Sarah told me herself, they could have easily been Saudis, not Americans, as they were preoccupied with saving Saudi pride and their business relationship with Saudi Arabia rather than her rights as an American. Even as she left, they told her one more time to avoid the media as it might embarrass them. Freedom of speech is one of the most precious freedoms our great forefathers have left to us. Representatives in our consulate in Saudi Arabia might do well to remember, such is the great heritage of all Americans. Thank you. Mr. Dornier, let me just say that I apologize for not letting you make your statement earlier. We were anxious to uh, hear from your daughter Sorry. and hear her story, but uh, that was a very moving uh, presentation, and, uh, and uh, I hope that everybody who heard it will take it to heart. Thank you. Do you have any more questions, Ms. Watson? I don't have a question. I just have a comment, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I want to thank you for pursuing this. I feel very deeply uh, the experiences you have and the fact that I think our government uh, has really let you down. And uh, I saw it occurring in my own embassy where I had to step in. And I intend, I want to make this commitment uh, not only to the two of you and those in the audience, but to the chair, that I'm going to pursue this issue. And so that we can train our turf. Everywhere we have an embassy, it's US, U.S. turf. And the people on that turf, to treat Americans with respect, to treat Americans with compassion, to be sure they know their rights, and to intercede for them in that, uh, on that post, in that land where they're stationed. I think that's the least we can do. And your last line confirms it. Thank you. As Americans, we have an obligation to you when you're on this turf, the United States of America, or turf sitting in Saudi Arabia, or sitting in China. We have a responsibility to you. And there's something missing in the State Department. I can describe if that's for another discussion. But you have my commitment, and I'm sure the chair will remain committed. And again, thank you. And I've thank you very got much. to go on. Thank through. you so much. Let, let, me just, let me just end up by saying, first of all, thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, it's nice to have you back. Uh, we'll continue to work to see if there's something that can be done to bring your children home. Uh, I am convinced there are hundreds, maybe thousands of women like you in Saudi Arabia who would like to come back. One woman told me, you know, just put me in a box with my kids, stick me any place on a yeah. plane, just get us out of here. And she told me her husband would kill her, and she gave detailed information on how he would kill her, which I'm not at liberty to talk about because he might know who she is if, I, if it was on television. Uh, but uh, we had a number of stories like that, so I know there's a lot of women like that. The one thing I will say about our consulate and our embassy uh, years ago, uh, Monica Stowers took her kids to the embassy in Riyadh, and uh, the counselor officer there took her and her children, escorted by Marines who didn't want to do this, to the front gate and put her out on the street. She was arrested, and her children stayed there, and her daughter was married off when she was 12 years old, and, uh, and uh, Pat Roush has gone through a similar situation. Those sorts of things, hopefully, won't occur anymore because now they will be uh, not kicked out on the street. There's a long way to go, and I think we've covered a lot of that today. And we're going to continue to work with the State Department and try to convince them that we ought to be tougher on the Saudis and others who are taking away the liberties of American citizens. And if somebody kidnaps a child from America, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Germany, or any place in the world, we ought to have some kind of an agreement with them that those people will be sent back for prosecution because they violated American law. And American law must not be superseded by the Saudi law or any other law in the world. And with that, I want to thank you very much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Watson is, uh, like she said, a former ambassador. She's a real tiger. And she and I will work together to see if we can't get some, 
steps taken in the right direction to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much for being Thank here. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. When the U.S. Senate comes back today, they plan to continue work on a bill setting spending priorities for State Department programs. It's one of several budget bills that might come to the floor this week. It might also see debate on a Defense Department spending bill and one that allocates money